So again, thanks to uh, for this opportunity to give you this seminar. And I'm presenting a, a, a work which spans over the last 10 years. And I'll, I'll try to talk you the, through uh, shortly through, through what happened to get me to here. So uh, uh, I'm a microbiologist. I'm a medical microbiologist, but I had no idea about macrophages. I had no idea about immunity. So uh, all this came uh, uh, from a discussion with somebody, Richard Moxon, which made me aware that I really didn't know anything about infection. And, and, and uh, why is it important to study infection? So uh, there is, if you look in the last 20 years, infections, the death rates, the, the mortality went down for AIDS, for malaria, for diarrheal disease, for tuberculosis. They all went down. This is the publication on the right side, the Lancet paper of 2016. They all went down and they went down significantly. But one, there's a one big exception, which is lower respiratory tract infection, not pneumonia and uh, not tuberculosis. This is acute pneumonia, viral and bacterial. And it's not only the one that since the early, since 1995 until now, is still on the top spot for uh, uh, age-adjusted mortality, but it also stayed stable. It didn't went down. Uh, also, meningitis had a similar problem. So it looks like maybe there is a main thing which we should address still in lower respiratory tract infection and maybe meningitis that maybe was overlooked. So uh, uh, where, where do I come from and what are the three steps I, I, I want to, uh, to, 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 to show to you? The first one is that I realized that a single bacterium starts invasive infection, and this was still done when I, before leaving Siena. Then I realized that that single bacterium has an important phase during infection in the tissue macrophages, and we're talking about the first 6, 10, 12, 24 hours of infection, and that this is not the case only for my model organism, but this is the case likely for many other situations we are starting to explore them. So this is the first work which we published in 2014, still with a group in, in Siena. And basically we infected, bacteria, uh, we infected mice by the intravenous route and we infected mice uh, with a mixture of bacteria. And the panel on the top right here, uh, can you see my mouse? I yes, hope. We can. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. So uh, uh, the the each each color here is a single animal, and the blue triangle means we can detect in the blood culture of these mice still a polyclonal infection. But then bacteria tend to disappear, and obviously, when you find no bacteria, either there are no bacteria or they start to become monoclonal red. So we had a single clone of bacteria only present. The surprising thing at day two, uh, uh, one uh, at, at 24, 48 and 72 hours was that the majority of blood cultures, the majority were monoclonal. This means bacteria were infected with a single clone only. And both statistical and genome analysis, we sequenced the, uh, these blood cultures, told us that it was a single cell that started infection. And this is the case, and this, I didn't invent this. This was the hypothesis of independent action, was published in 1957. So this is endless time ago. And uh, uh, basically it tells, when you are at a dose below the LD50 or at the LD50, then half of the animals, half of the humans are fine, and the others most likely get infected from a single microorganism. Another thing that this uh, work showed us is that, we, that in the first hours, we know the bacteria go down there, cleared from the blood. And if we knock out the neutrophils by antibody treatment, they still go down. 
But if we uh, knock out the activity of the macrophages in mice, bacteria stay the same. So we know it's macrophages which do the killing in the first hours. Macrophages, there is no, not much macrophages in the blood. In the blood, we have monocytes, but not macrophages. So it's not the blood. It's not the neutrophils. And there is no antibodies, obviously, in mice which are not immunized. So it is tissue macrophages. And these are macrophages in the liver or in the spleen. When we took blood cultures, and these are the three panels on the lower part, and in black you have a positive blood culture. And these are 10 mice. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 mice. Sorry, 12 mice. And in three of them we have a positive blood cultures at 24 hours. But other two had some counts in the spleen, but none in the blood. When we looked at 48 hours, uh, Sorry, if we if we uh, looked at 48 hours, again, we had three positive blood cultures because we are below the LD50, only few mice get ill. But again, two had no blood cultures, but some in the spleen. Same thing at 72, more mice ill, but still one with bacteria in the spleen and not in the blood. And this told us, so the spleen is the main organ that clears away the bacteria, but it is also the spleen that then recedes bacteria into the bloodstream. So we found the first finding that a single bacterium starts bacteremia. So I found it again. It was found by others before, but it had it made it it's a switch in my in my in my brain in, on how to understand infection. So it's not a wave of bacteria which infect you. It's one. So you have to find what that one does in order to prevent disease and understand disease. And we also understood its macrophages in the spleen that uh, in this infection. Uh, stop, block the infection, but we also had the indication that the uh, it is the spleen where the infection then comes back. What are the new questions? Where are the bacteria while they disappear? And why is the organism not able to block them? This was a play paper then done in, at Leicester uh, of, by my postdoc Giuseppe. Giuseppe Ercoli, and basically we, uh, with the help of an immuno immunologist, these are the different macrophages in the spleen. There are three different macrophage types in the spleen, the red pulp macrophages and the red pulp. Then there is this green ring of macrophages, which are CD169 positive macrophages, and the violet ones, they make another ring around these, which are the marginal zone macrophages. What we saw if we infect these animals intravenously, and we did it both in mice and in pig organs, which we did perfuse. Uh, uh, we take the organ from the abattoir uh, and, and, and then bring it in the lab and perfuse it. We have initially single bacteria 30 minutes after infection in the spleen. The blue is the cells in the spleen. It's a lot of macrophages. And uh, uh, at four hours, we see in these red CD169 positive macrophages, we see multiple bacteria. So we have the impression that these bacteria are replicating. To, in, to, to confirm this, we infected with two different strains and we marked them with two different antibodies, red and green antibodies. And if a macrophage would take in many bacteria, it would take in the green and the red bacteria. But we found always, sorry, it's very small, either green or red dots in the spleen. So either they're all red or they're all green. We never found a mixed thing indicating that if you find 10, 16, 4 bacteria in a cell, they were not taken up separately, but they replicated in that macrophage. Then we saw that the violet macrophages are the killer macrophages. And obviously, if you see a bacterium, it's a single one because they are killed after that. But in the red part, in, in the CD169s, there is some replication ongoing. Why is the CD169 the only problem? Because the red pulp, blood is going into the red pulp. The red pulp gets blood. Blood brings neutrophils. Neutrophils arrive in the red pulp, increase in the red pulp, and probably kill whatever is happening there. So they clean. But no neutrophils go where the CD169 macrophages is. So what has happened is basically the CD169 macrophages have the bacteria growing inside, then they pop open at 8, 12 hours, 
and that has rapidly uh, replicating bacteria which start disease. If we target these macrophages, we can block foci formations of bacterial replication in the macrophage and mice survive. So while the macrophages are the ones that kill 99.999% of the bacteria, in some macrophages they replicate and start making disease. If we block that, no disease. Okay, so a single bacterium, we are still with a single bacterium, so we don't care about many bacteria. A single bacterium starts infection, and a single bacterium uh, is in splenic macrophages. These are in the CD169 macrophages because the others are less important, they are taken care of by the neutrophils. And if we block these macrophages, we block disease. But we don't know obviously, if this has any relevance for humans, and more importantly, if this has any relevance for pneumonia, because we are injecting bacteria in the tail vein of mice or in the organ of pigs. And this obviously is a model. It tells us something. It doesn't tell us human disease. So uh, uh, since we were able to perfuse pig organs, uh, I managed to, to obtain the auth. I talked to surgeons and they said, oh, do you want to have human organs? I said, oh, wow, fine. So we applied for a clinical trial. I got the authorization and I get human spleens from pancreas cancer operation. The pancreas is here, the spleen is here. I don't know if you see that. And if you take out sometimes the tail of the pancreas, you take out also the spleen. These patients are very kind and 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 uh, sign a con uh, 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 consent form that if the spleen has to be taken out and it is not used for histology, we can use it to infect it. So we get the spleen. It's immediately perfused, so there is no blood clotting in the spleen. The, then it is perfused and oxygenated for uh, six hours, and we can see what is happening. And the panel above, you see uh, infection. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spleens. And we have an early and a late time point. And sometimes we have two different bacteria with which we infect. But uh, what I want to show you is again, uh, that you could see the violet one, which is a nice example. If we look at the early time point, we can see very few bacteria and there, so there is the spleen, and we infect the, the, the blood supply of the spleen. We infect that. If we take a sample at half an hour, we see very few bacteria in the spleen, and there's one or two bacteria only in the cell we find. But if we look later, we can see either two or three or four or eight bacteria in a single macrophage. So we know that over time, uh, uh, we don't know if they really replicate. We cannot say this for the human spleen so far, but we know that over time we have more bacteria in the macrophage. We suppose in the human macrophage, they replicate, but we don't have the confirmation. We only have a statistical association that we see later more bacteria in splenic macrophages. And it's very few. So it's very unlikely that it's one macrophage out of thousand that takes up two bacteria. It's not impossible, but we don't know. We know that in the human macrophages, in the human spleen, these bacteria are within the cell. They're intracellular. There are both types of bacteria we can see in the cells. And it's again, the same CD169 positive cells in the spleen. But we don't know if this happens in pneumonia because we have the, ex, uh, the spleen only. Colleagues from us, Carlos Oriela, and uh, uh, they in the US in eight years ago, seven years ago, something like this, they set up a, a baboon, which are non human primates, pneumonia model. And according to them and according to their papers, this model mimics human pneumonia. And I called him and said, Look, Carlos, do you have spleens? And he said, Yes, I have spleen slices frozen. Uh, 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 do you want to look at them? That was fantastic. So he sent me the 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 the, the, the slides with with the with the pieces of of baboon spleen during pneumonia. And on the graph down on the bottom, you see seven baboons, four 
where the spleen was, where the baboon was uh, killed during pneumonia. And you see there are bacteremic pneumonias. And in the spleen, you see that many, many macrophages have multiple bacteria inside. So some even have like 16 or 14 or 13 bacteria in one macrophage. So also during pneumonia in the baboon model, we can see, we did not do the baboon experiments. We got very kindly from Carlos the, the, the baboon samples. We can see clusters of bacteria in splenic macrophages. After antibiotic treatment, three baboons were recovered, had no disease, were fine, were terminated a week later or so. We still can see intracellular bacteria in the spleen. Okay, so we know it's happening in humans. We know it's happening in pneumonia, but we don't know the dynamics. So we had to go back to mice. We had to go back to mice and we played with an antibiotic. There is an antibiotic called azithromycin. It's a macrolide and it's concentrated 100 to 300 times in macrophages. So it's an antibiotic which we gave at a dose to mice that is below the, the, the MIC in serum. So the serum was fine for bacteria. Bacteria could happily grow in serum and in the blood. But in the spleen, the quantity of, of, of azithromycin was above the MIC. And the graph in panel B tells you this, that at 6, 12, 24 hours, all mice had in the spleen, in the macrophage, concentrations above the MIC. So they block bacterial replication in the macrophage. In the serum, the concentration of azithromycin was below the MIC. So we know we have an animal model where the macrophages can kill, but they are not permitted to allow for replication. And what did we see? If you look only at the blue animals here, these are mice. This is a time course, 6, 12, 24, and 48 hours in the lung. So these mice have bacteria in the lung. Uh, these mice are treated with azithromycin and they have bacteria in the lung, same numbers. We did histology, we did confocal microscopy, the lung looks the same. So they have the same pneumonia, okay? So our azithromycin did nothing to the pneumonia. But the animals treated with PBS were dying, while the animals treated with azithromycin were happy. So what happened? And you can see maybe in the red, color down on the right side, in the animals treated with PBS, at 6, 12 hours, we have negative blood counts, but blood becomes positive. Then all mice have positive bacteremia, and then mice develop signs of sepsis, and we have to terminate the experiments. But this tells you, you have a pneumonia, and they all get sepsis. This is the mouse model. But if you look at those that were treated with azithromycin here on the right side, they are all negative. Only two mice had low bacterial counts in the blood. We could go back and check the azithromycin concentration in that spleen of that mouse, and this one was below the MIC. So bacteria could replicate in the spleens, and this you see in green. In green, the mice treated with PBS all have become positive in the spleen. Mice uh, treated with azithromycin, except those two mice are negative. What does this tell us? And this is so important. I love this. Um, I hope you will love this too. Uh, blood counts, the severity, the sepsis, the bacteremia associated to pneumonia does not depend on bacterial load in the lung. It depends on bacteria load in the spleen. So it's the spleen counts which correlates with blood counts, not the lung counts. Because the problem in human disease, you have low severity pneumonia, high severity pneumonia. Nobody understands where the problem is because they have all pneumonia. The problem is not the lung. The problem might be the spleen. So there is a different place which we have to treat. And this is very important because Human pneumonia, high severity pneumonia, is treated with two drugs. 
if you come into the hospital, you have high severity pneumonia, you are treated with two drugs, and the two, two drugs is a beta-lactam, which works fantastically in serum, in blood, and a macrolide, azithromycin. Why? Nobody knows well why. Maybe because you have chlamydia pneumonia, maybe you have mycoplasma pneumonia, so macrolide will cover against that. Now, with that paper, I think we provide the evidence. It's most likely not that you exclude chlamydia and mycoplasma pneumonia. It is that the beta-lactam addresses fantastically the lung, but the macrolide addresses the spleen. And this is also why uh, this double treatment is, is, is better than single beta-lactam treatment. So we came from a complete academic idea, single bacteria make disease, which you say is a stupid academic useless uh, finding. It's not finding because it taught me how to look at disease and taught me how to find uh, uh, a probable, a likely explanation for uh, 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 success in treatment that it's in the guideline, but nobody knows exactly why. So this was done by David, Josie, Drun, and Ryan. And basically the main, the big finding is, so humans, we have fossa in the spleens. During pneumonia in the baboon, we know fossa in the spleens forms even if, if you have pneumonia. And mice tell us it is the spleen counts which correlate with the blood counts. It is not the lung counts, even if the pneumonia was the same. And it has an imp this has an implication, it has an implication for human disease and treatment. Now I have two other parts of my presentation, which are how we try now to branch out from this finding. So this is submitted, it's with eBiomedicine. We got uh, 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 positive reviewer comments back and we hope to be uh, 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 able to respond soon. So we did this also with a different bacterium. And uh, we got this bacterium from Gianni Rossolini in Fl Florence. This is Klebsiella. Klebsiella pneumonia makes liver abscess. And there is some uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. I don't know, I have a black bar on top. I hope you can see the whole slide in any case. Uh, we took a, a six in red and blue Klebsiella pneumonia hypermucoid strains, which make a different disease than the other Klebsiellas. And we took seven carbapenem resistant strains, which are those that are antibiotic resistant, but don't make severe invasive disease and liver abscess. Uh, we infected mice with these uh, strains and we realized uh, they go all nicely in the liver. And in the liver, they don't go somewhere, they just go in the F480 positive Kupfer cell macrophages. In the panel to the right is again the counts of bacteria in a single macrophage. And you can see that the red and blood uh, Klebsiellas have, if you count, multiple bacteria in a macrophage. Often, obviously, go away. You have often, sometimes single bacteria in a macrophage, but sometimes you have five, eight, six, eight, whatever, 16, 20 different bacteria in one macrophage. If you infect intravenously mice with the multidrug resistant Klebsiellas, you sometimes have more than one bacterium, but generally you have single bacteria in the infection. Again, we infected with a K1 and a K2 strain, went with two different antibodies. And basically, if you see multiple bacteria here in panel D, Either there are multiple green ones or multiple red ones. So again, demonstrating, it's not a macrophage that takes different bacteria, but it's one bacteria in that replicates, and so they're all the same color. And here on the right, uh, it's, it's a 3D reconstruction of, and you see the bacteria inside the cell. So they're inside the macrophage. So this is in the liver, and it's again, uh, the uh, CD169 positive, Kupfer cell macrophage, tissue macrophages of the spleen, and the Klebsiella is within the macrophage. In the panel F down on the left, you see uh, in a time course, uh, 30 minutes, six hours, 24 hours, the multidrug resistant strains, you have no, nearly no bacteria and they disappear. 
but uh, the, the K1 uh, hypermucoid, hypervirulent ones, increase in the first six hours and then stay at the same level. So we th so they replicate in the first six hours in these macrophages, and then they likely stop. Uh, what happens then? If we look at the neutrophil, because we are looking at abscesses, so an abscess is a huge lump of neutrophils, okay? And what you can see here, same time points, uh, 30 minutes, six hours, 24 hours, there is nearly no neutrophils coming in the first six hours. Why? Because the bacteria are in the cells. So the bacteria can replicate before the neutrophils arrive. So they make a blob of bacteria, hypermucoid blob of bacteria, and then something happens, macrophage explodes, neutrophils comes. And here we can see the forming of the abscess over time uh, at 24 hours. Oh no, sorry, this is a zoom, it's not a time course. And in the center of the macrophage, you won't see that maybe there is a tiny green because you have, sorry, not macrophage, you have the liver, a lot of neutrophils in pink, and in the center of the pink is still the lump of green bacteria, which are probably hidden in the hypermucoid colony-like capsule, and therefore the abscess cannot be cleared. So it's not a single bacterium that starts an abscess, it is multiple bacteria after intracellular replication. But we wanted to, this came back, it was at Lancet Microbe, it came back, it's for us very luckily for many months now because we have to reply to the referee and Lancet is very kind with us and gives us a lot of time. I hope we'll get another two weeks because we are nearly there. We have single things. So I'm basically finished with this, but one thing to, re to remind you, tissue macrophages are those that kill the incoming bacteria in the non-immune hosts. But then it looks like there is a lot of situations where in diseases we didn't really look careful enough. There is a stage where bacteria replicate in the macrophage before making the disease. And this is the group. My group is on the left and other academic colleagues in Leicester down here. Then these are my international collaborators, which help to do all this work. Thank you.